Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Berry, a family physician with 20 years of clinical experience so far. And today in this lecture, I'm going to help you be smarter than your doctor, most likely. Unless your doctor is me or one of the other low-carb specialists in the world, they're not going to know this information. So even though it's not your problem, even though it's not your fault, it is your problem, even though it's not your job, it will become your responsibility for your overall health and for your family's health to know these things and to be able to work with these things. So I've got some slides prepared for you. We're going to go through these. Thanks a lot for joining me for this. I think that uh, hopefully this will be somewhat enjoyable, and I think you're going to learn some very necessary information that you need because your doctor probably doesn't know. So how to predict type 2 diabetes up to 10 to 20 years before it happens. So the goals are to make you smarter than your doctor. The goal is to make you completely immune from ever developing type 2 diabetes. Or if you already have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, to understand how it works so that you can absolutely reverse the process and therefore reverse your prediabetes or your type 2 diabetes and to help your loved ones and your friends and your neighbors to also reverse their type 2 diabetes or prediabetes and to keep it from ever developing if they are, don't have it yet. So the cost of type 2 diabetes is, is immense. It costs billions, hundreds of billions of dollars just in the United States alone. At least 25 million people in the U.S. have type 2 diabetes and it's predicted that a third of adults by 2050, if we don't change this, and by we, I mean you and me, if we don't change this, a third of all adults are going to have type 2 diabetes by 2050. So the current paradigm of type 2 diabetes is, is, is really an exercise in ridiculousness. Um, you'll get things like, we're not exactly sure why you have it. Maybe it's genetics, and many uh, healthcare providers and researchers think that genetics is the predominant cause. And I'm going to show you that's just not true at all. Uh, many healthcare providers think that it's your lifestyle, you, you don't exercise enough, therefore you got type 2. Some people think it's your, your diet. Uh, I think it is your diet, and most of the low-carb practitioners that you'll seek out will think that as well. I went to the Centers for Disease Control, uh, their website in the United States. And if you're not in the U.S., you may think, well, who cares what they say? What you need to understand is that many other countries will follow lockstep what the U.S. CDC says, the U.S. American Diabetes Association, the U.S. American Heart Association. So what these guys say kind of trickles down to the rest of the world. It's not fair, but that's how it is. So on their website, under what causes type 2 diabetes, here's what they say. Insulin is a hormone made by your pancreas that acts like a key to let blood sugar into the cells in your body for use as energy. I agree. If you have type 2 diabetes, cells don't respond normally to insulin. Partly true. This is called insulin resistance. Your pancreas makes more insulin to try to get cells to respond. I agree. Eventually, your pancreas can't keep up and your blood sugar rises, setting the stage for prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Now, most of that statement's true, but... Did you miss something in that statement? I didn't, I didn't hear a cause for type 2 diabetes. Did you? I, they don't mention the cause. They just basically go through a few rudimentary physiological steps, <clears throat> none of which is the cause of type 2 diabetes. But after this lecture, you'll know exactly what causes it and how to prevent it or reverse it. So what I propose is a new paradigm for type 2 diabetes. We know exactly what causes it if we're thinking about the condition properly. Genetics does play a tiny role, probably less than 1%. Your lifestyle, your, your, diet, your activity level, your meditation, your sleep, that probably does play a role, probably less than 1%. 98, 98, uh, 99% of the cause of your type 2 diabetes, should you ever develop it, is your diet. And you'll see why that is shortly. Type 2 diabetes is a carbohydrate overdose syndrome. It is a carbohydrate toxicity. Some would even say a carbohydrate poisoning of the human physiology. <clears throat> so the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. If you get, if your doctor checks your blood sugar and it's above, and your fasting blood sugars above 126, 
That's, that can be used as a formal diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. If you have a two-hour glucose tolerance test and, the, and, and you have a level above 200, that can be diagnostic. If you have a random blood sugar any time of the day before or after meals that's ever above 200, you have type 2 diabetes by definition. And then we now use a very important test called a hemoglobin A1C. And if your hemoglobin A1C level is above 6.4, that is definitional of type 2 diabetes. Now, pre-diabetes, which millions of people are walking around the world with right now, probably hundreds of millions, is, is part of the pathway to get to type 2 diabetes. And many doctors aren't aware that pre-diabetes is dangerous. They're not aware that damage is done. They're not aware that it's something they should even be checking for. Pre-diabetes is defined as a fasting blood sugar of 100 to 125 if you're fasting, a two-hour glucose tolerance test that gives you a blood sugar reading of 140 to 199, or a hemoglobin A1C from 5.7 up to 6.4. That's considered pre-diabetes. Many doctors don't check for this. They're, they're not aware of it, so you have to be. So here's a kind of a visual representation of that. And you'll notice there that it's not a, a yes or no question. Do you have type 2 diabetes or not? Are you pre-diabetic or not? It's a spectrum. And so it's a very slow, insidious process from moving from normal towards pre-diabetes and ultimately type 2 diabetes. So if type 2 diabetes is carb toxicity, how do you predict it before it happens and thus prevent it or reverse it? So let me tell you a story about my neighbor's dog. So my neighbor's dog barked all the time. And my other neighbor decided to get rid of the dog. And so he started putting rat poison in the dog's food. And the dog got very sick. The dog uh, wouldn't bark anymore, which was good for my other neighbor. But also his, his skin, his hair, his, his coat of, of fur all started to look terrible. And my, my neighbor who owned the dog took the dog to the doctor. And the doctor said, well, this dog's being poisoned. Somebody's putting rat poison in the food. And so my neighbor corrected that situation, much to the chagrin of my other neighbor. Immediately, the dog started to look better, feel better, act better, and bark again all the time. Now, how would you describe this dog's poisoning? Would you say that the dog's poisoning is in remission? Or would you say that the, do the, dog, the dog's owner had reversed the dog's rat poisoning, or, but it would probably come back later? Would you say that rat poisoning was genetic or lifestyle related? Or would you say it was 99% due to the dog's diet, which consisted of rat poison? So this is the paradigm I want you to use to think of type 2 diabetes and prediabetes. It's not a question. The dog's uh, rat poisoning is not in remission. The dog is cured of the rat poisoning because my other neighbor found out what the other neighbor was doing and had him arrested. That's a cure. And the same paradigm applies to type 2 diabetes. Now, there are some physical signs of type 2 diabetes that start to develop years before you actually have an A1C high enough to get a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Acanthosis nigricans is one such physical sign. It's a darkening of the skin. It usually happens on the neck. It can happen on the throat, it can happen under the armpits, it can happen in the groin area, and the skin's just darker than the surrounding skin for no apparent reason. This, this is not dirt, this will not wash off, you can't scrub this off. Another is skin tags. If you ask the average doctor, they'll tell you skin tags are genetic, they have nothing to do with your diet or lifestyle, there's nothing you can do to reverse skin tags, you can only have them surgically removed. Skin tags are a huge red flag that you are developing hyperinsulinemia and you're moving towards either prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Central adiposity, so someone who's otherwise slender or slim or normal size, but they have a belly pooch. This is almost pathognomonic for hyperinsulinemia, which is the very first step towards prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Other risk factors for type 2 diabetes are hypertension, gestational diabetes, um, fatty liver, PCOS, a very low HDL level, high triglycerides, sleep apnea, age greater than 45 years, mental health diagnosis of any kind, and, or dementia. And the, the, these may seem like, well, that's just a weird random assortment of, of other diagnoses. 
I don't see a pattern there. But once you understand what's going on, you do see a pattern here because every other single one of these diagnoses is intimately related to hyperinsulinemia, which comes from eating too many carbohydrates. This is metabolic syndrome, and another word for that would be chronic hyperinsulinemia. Now let's go back to the black and white evidence. Lab testing, there are two tests that you can really use to figure out where you're at on that spectrum of normal to prediabetes to diabetes. And also you can use these two numbers to predict your risk of developing type 2 diabetes if you don't fix your diet. There's no need to fast for either one of these tests. You can do them any time of the day. They're very reliable, but like any lab test, they're not 100% perfect. But I love these two tests because if, if you pop into your doctor's office at 4.30 p.m. and you've eaten twice that day, you can still have these two labs checked and they're still going to give you the results you need. They want, they're not altered by your eating. So a hemoglobin A1C, what is that? So basically, when your blood sugar is higher than it should be, some of the sugar sticks to proteins, and this is called glycation. And so the hemoglobin A1C specifically measures the, the amount of glycation or sugar stuck to the hemoglobin linkages on red blood cells. An elevated hemoglobin A1C means that you are eating or drinking, and the drinking is important, you're eating or drinking too much glucose, fructose, or galactose. Now, many doctors don't know this, but all three of these uh, monosaccharides or simple sugars cause glycation. And so you can eat a completely glucose-free diet. And if you're still consuming too much fructose from fruits or fruit juices or soft drinks, or too much galactose from drinking too much skim milk and eating too much uh, fat-free dairy, you can still cause glycation of all of the proteins in your body, but this particular test just measures the glycation of the hemoglobin linkage on the red blood cell. So normal is less than 5.7, and the, the further under normal you can get, it, the better. Pre-diabetic is 5.7 to 6.4, and type 2 diabetes is defined as 6.5 or higher. Now the C-peptide test. What is C-peptide? So C-peptide is part of the pre-pro-insulin molecule. So you start out, your beta cells in your pancreas are making insulin. They actually make a molecule called pre-pro-insulin, and it looks like this on the left. And then you break off this little piece, and you have pro-insulin. So the green is the C-peptide, and these over here make up the ultimate insulin molecule. So for every molecule of insulin you have in your bloodstream, you have a C-peptide molecule. They are made side by side and indeed were part of the, the pro-molecule that insulin comes from. So C-peptide is an excellent surrogate marker for the amount of insulin that you've been producing. And there's a little more information if you want to read about that. So the normal range uh, for most reference labs is 0.8 to 3.85 nanograms per milliliter for C-peptide. Now, many doctors, and probably even your doctor, has never heard of a C-peptide. And I'm going to give you some case studies coming up shortly where you will understand just how handicapped your doctor is if your doctor's not checking a C-peptide level. Many doctors, when you ask them to order it, they'll say things like, I don't even know what that is, or I don't even know how that would help me to know the result. Well, this is a great opportunity for you as a patient to be able to educate your doctor, because when you educate your doctor, you actually help all of the hundreds of other patients that that doctor is caring for. Sometimes you can't educate your doctor, you just have to fire your doctor. Now, let's do some predictions. Now, here is, uh, and these are the case studies I was telling you about, and after you go through these case studies, you're going to be smarter than the average doctor when it comes to predicting prediabetes and type 2 diabetes, and in fact, even in diagnosing prediabetes and the risk for becoming type 2 diabetic. So we have a 30-year-old female with a, a, a base a body mass index of 25. Uh, she's eating a paleo diet. So that BMI, that's not bad. That's pretty good. Actually, it's quite good compared to the normal person walking the street. She has a couple of very small skin tags here and there on her neck. She doesn't have any of the acanthosis nigricans, the dark pigmentation we talked about earlier. You check her A1C and her C-peptide. Her hemoglobin A1C is 5.5, which is normal, and her C-peptide is 2.5, which 
which is normal. Okay, and they're actually, those are very good numbers. So what's your prediction for this woman? Is she on track to develop type 2 diabetes? She's metabolically normal. She's very low risk currently of developing type 2 diabetes. Now, as you get older, remember, age was one of the risk factors for type 2 diabetes. As you get older, you become more insulin resistant, and you perhaps even become more hyperinsulinemic. So she needs to check at least once a year. So when she's 31, she'll have these checked again. And at any point, if she starts to see these numbers go in the wrong direction, she can adjust her diet long before she ever develops prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Now, here's another case. 46-year-old male with a, a BMI of 29, and he eats a whatever diet, whatever he sees he eats. He's got several 2 to 5 millimeter skin tags on his neck. He's got a few under his arms. He's got one in his groin. He doesn't have any of the acanthosis nigricans. His hemoglobin A1C was 5.6, which is normal, but his C-peptide was 4.7. Now, this gentleman, if you checked a fasting blood sugar, would also have a normal fasting blood sugar. So he has a normal fasting blood sugar, and if the doctor went to the extra trouble and checked an A1C, that's normal as well. The, the majority of doctors out there practicing would say this guy has no risk for type 2 diabetes. He's doing fine. He can keep eating his whatever diet, but there's a problem. I checked to see peptide on this gentleman. It was 4.7. So his C peptide is high, even though his A1C is normal and his fasting blood sugar is normal. This gentleman has a problem. Now, what's your prediction? This gentleman is hyperinsulinemic and also probably insulin resistant, and he has a very high risk of developing type 2 diabetes within the next 10 years. His pancreas is having to work harder and secrete more insulin to take care of the carbohydrate load he's eating. And so he's keeping his A1C and fasting sugar normal at the time being, but his pancreas is having to work double time in order to do it. That will not continue forever. Another case, 52-year-old female with a BMI of 31. She eats lots of whole grains, lots of fruits and vegetables. She tries to avoid saturated fat as much as she can. She would never dream of eating bacon. Okay? She has no skin tags. She has no acanthosis nigricans. Her hemoglobin A1C is 5.9, and her C-peptide is 5.7. Now, if you check the fasting blood sugar on her, it might be normal, or it might just be one or two points high. And how many of you watching this have had an episode where you went to the doctor and your fasting blood sugar was 101, 102, and your doctor said, that's eh, no big deal. We'll just watch it. We'll check it again next year. This is this could be you if that's the case. So she is, what, what, what do you see from these numbers? What is she? You ready? She's pre-diabetic. And within five, plus or minus five years, she will be a type 2 diabetic. Her pancreas is working double time, if not triple time, pumping out insulin, trying to deal with all the carbohydrates in her fruits and her grains and her low-fat diet. And it's no longer able to keep the A1C normal. It's starting to creep up, and it's up to 5.9 now. So she's creeped over into, into pre-diabetes land even with her pancreas pumping out insulin at a very high rate. So you can see she is very hyperinsulinemic. She is insulin resistant, and now she's also pre-diabetic. You see how these two numbers, they really give you the power to know exactly where you're at on that, that spectrum I showed you earlier. Next, a 36-year-old Asian female with a BMI of 24. She eats lots of rice, fruit, vegetables, uh, doesn't hardly ever eat meat, eats almost no saturated fat, has a beautiful BMI. Anybody would look at her and think she's the picture of health. And this, this scenario is actually quite common in Asia and in India. And we call this tofi, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. Here's why. <clears throat> she does have a little pot belly. It's a very cute little pot belly, but otherwise she's very slender. So we checked her numbers and look what we found. Hemoglobin A1C of 6.2. C peptide of 12.1. What is your diagnosis, doctor? What do you think about this? What's your prediction? She's a type 2 diabetic. She has an A1C of 6.5. Now, this woman also could have a normal fasting blood sugar. That is possible, even with these numbers being this terrible. If someone like this doesn't eat for, for 8, 12, 16 hours, 
they can have a normal blood sugar even though they are a type 2 diabetic. So only by checking these two numbers would you know what's going on. So she's a type 2 diabetic, she, and, and it's absolutely caused by this diet, which we're told by people like the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association is very healthy. She's also very slender, another big marker for health that we think, oh, you're slender. She's got a little pot belly, but that's no big deal. The numbers don't lie. And this is when you check the lab work that matters, you uncover this poor lady is having daily damage done by type 2 diabetes, and she had no idea. Now, here's a trick case. 25-year-old <clears throat> female with a BMI of 21. She eats meat and veg usually, every now and then dessert. She's got several skin tags, but no acanthos and snigercans. Her hemoglobin A1C is 11.2. She's severely diabetic. But is she a type 2 diabetic? Well, let's see what her C-peptide was, because that's also how you tease out is someone a type 2 or a type 1 diabetic? Her C-peptide is 0.1. Very, very low. So if her pancreas is making almost no C-peptide, then that means her pancreas is also making almost no insulin. So this lady is a, is a newly diagnosed, not type 2 diabetic. She's a type 1 diabetic that's just been missed by her doctor for probably 10 years. She just, she, she recalls she's always been thirsty and she always pees 10 times a day, but she never, never really went to the doctor. The few times she did, they, they didn't check any blood work. So she had no idea she was doing terrible, irreparable damage from being a type 1 diabetic that was undiagnosed. So she immediately will need to be started on some insulin and she'll immediately need to be instructed on her diet. You see how these two numbers really make it crystal clear the difference between type 1, type 2, and the difference between normal prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is actually a toxicity syndrome or an overdose situation. You're eating a daily overdose of carbohydrate for your physiology personally. Everybody's physiology is a little different based on their age, their gender, their hormone status, their, their lifestyle. Everybody has a different cutoff. We, you heard about the personal fat threshold. There's also a personal carbohydrate threshold for every human being. And if you're eating more than your daily threshold, you're going to start down the road that we've been talking about. Remember my neighbor's dog. My neighbor's dog didn't have rat poison resistance syndrome. My neighbor's dog didn't reverse or put his rat poisoning in remission. They just stopped poisoning the damn dog and the dog went back to normal. That's exactly what happens to human beings. When you stop poisoning them with a daily overdose of carbohydrates, they go back to normal. Isn't that nice? It's very simple. So metabolic syndrome is roughly equal to insulin resistance, which is roughly equal but has different mechanisms to hyperinsulinemia. They all go hand in hand. Insulin resistance, I would like to rename to carbohydrate-induced hyperinsulinemia. I think the words we use are very, very important. When you talk about insulin resistance, it doesn't really speak to that C-peptide. It doesn't really speak to the, the, the fact that you have chronically high insulin levels in your blood. So let's start calling it carbohydrate-induced hyperinsulinemia. Let's start calling type 2 diabetes, which really shouldn't even be called diabetes anyway. It's a completely different thing. Let's start calling it carbohydrate toxicity syndrome, because that's exactly what it is. And also in the, in the new name for it, you immediately know what to do to fix it. Just like my poor dog had rat poisoning. You see how the, the uh, solution is actually in the name? Just stop the rat poison. Carbohydrate toxicity syndrome. How do you fix that? Well, I would guess you cut down your carbohydrate intake. See how that works? Humans are low carbohydrate mammals by design. We, are, we were never designed to eat a high carbohydrate diet. And when you feed us a high carbohydrate diet, we get sick, just like the dog when you feed the dog rat poison. That's it, guys. I really hope you enjoyed this. Uh, check out all my other videos on YouTube. Go follow me on social media. I try to be all over the place so I can help as many people as I possibly can. It's been a pleasure doing this with you, and I thank you so much for joining me. This is Dr. Barry. I'll see you next time. 
Ken Berry, excellent talk, wasn't it? C peptide. Now he relates that to insulin. I've always measured serum insulin. Uh, should I be measuring C peptide instead? I think it does have some utility and there's two cases in which I personally find C peptide useful in clinic. So the first one is if we accept somebody may have an autoimmune cause to their diabetes. So there's this condition, latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, and that's surprisingly common in otherwise diagnosed type 2 diabetics. And uh, as well as testing for autoimmune markers, um, C-peptide can obviously uh, measure your endogenous, which is the insulin that your own body makes secretion. And for somebody perhaps who's had a, got a failing pancreas, or perhaps who's injecting insulin and we don't know how much their pancreas is producing, I think C-peptide certainly has real utility. But there's another element uh, of where C-peptide becomes quite useful. So if we're measuring absolute levels of insulin, it's very hard to distinguish between an increased secretion and an impaired clearance. Um, and certainly we know, certainly if we have a look at our insulin levels in the brain, then uh, defects in insulin clearance certainly play a large role of the uh, disease in the brain. So if we're actually getting a C-peptide and an insulin at the same time, that can allow us to distinguish between the two to a certain degree. The other thing he talked about, well, one of the things he talked about was glycation. And you know, obviously we're very familiar with glycation, uh, from glucose and fructose, but he mentioned galactose, which is not normally uh, spoken about and particularly referred to low-fat dairy products. Yeah, I mean, there's low-fat dairy really has no redeeming features. And I think what a lot of people don't know, sure, you've got this extra amount of sugar, um, you know, galactose in dairy products. Um, and if you then combine that with dairy protein, so dairy protein, interestingly enough, is also uniquely potent at inducing insulin resistance. So there's been plenty of studies where they've actually compared dairy protein to other animal sources of protein. And the uh, dairy protein has been able to stimulate uh, uh, much larger degrees of insulin resistance. And that can certainly be a problem for some people. And that's one reason why um, uh, some people who are struggling to lose weight actually benefit significantly when they reduce the dairy in their diet. Um, and of course, if you've got the low fat dairy with uh, loads of galactose coming in and over the top of that, then you've really got a double whammy. Yeah, look, I really enjoyed Ken's, uh, Ken's talk. I think we've been very fortunate to, uh, to have such a clear uh, explanation of the whole diabetes uh, thing. This was excellent. Well, I can absolutely tell you, I've had the pleasure of uh, having some uh, dinners with Ken and I can tell you what you see is what you get. He is uh, just a, a true knock-around bloke, and I say that with the, the most esteem possible. Uh, it's absolutely a pleasure every time we get to spend time with him.